A very good afternoon, everyone, and a warm welcome to Yayasan Mendaki's Education Symposium 2020. This third webinar session is titled, How Do We Help Children Feel Safe and Ready to Learn? My name is Hazik, and I am your MC for today. Joining us for today's session, we have Dr. Anne Rifkin Graboy, the Head of Infancy and Early Childhood Research at the National Institute of Education's Center for Research in Child Development, Dr. Naradlin Yusuf, Registered Psychologist and Partner at Impetus and Principal Educational and Clinical Psychologist and Assistant Director at Community Psychology Hub, and Ms. Yirani Mustajab, Manager at Yayasan Mendaki's Partner Relations and Recognition Department. Ms. Yirani is our moderator for today. Thank you for taking the time out to be here with us this afternoon. Today's session will be broken down into two segments. The first 20 minutes will be a presentation by Dr. N on today's topic, how do we help children feel safe and ready to learn? And the next 40 minutes will be a panel discussion. We will start today's session with a presentation by Dr. N. Dr. N will discuss why identifying signs of stress are important and the different ways parents and, and teachers can respond positively. May I now invite Dr. N, please? Uh, Dr. Adlin, I, I have a question. I mean, uh, I myself as a parent of four children, very, uh, you know, it's a wide range of ages. I have a preteen who is 14, uh, currently very emo, and I have twins who are in primary one, and I have an eight-month-old. So, uh, you know, <laughs> having four kids all together, uh, how, how, it, how would, you, would you advise me to manage my emotions uh, when it comes to uh, engaging for them? I mean, sometimes I would really love to just get all of them in the same room uh, and, and engage them. Perhaps you can share with me. Give me some tips. <laughs> So wonderful, your question. Thank you so much, Suryani, for posing that. And I think, um, wow, amazing. You have four children um, of varying ages. And, uh, you know, as a, a working mom, it's never easy. And I really marvel how uh, women, uh, you know, as parents, as professionals, we try our best to, you know, get things done and, you know, get our family in order, get ourselves in order. So it's really a members of a task. So wonderful. Um, in your efforts as well. I think um, if I could share one, maybe main idea is to perhaps consider a routine that has a kind of a nice flow that you have um, for everyone to know what's expected on a day-to-day -day basis. Um, sometimes the older ones could then chip in to help with the younger ones, but it's also the idea of you know having that um, kind of a team approach whereby everybody is looking out for one another. Uh, there's a kind of a routine, a kind of uh, flow and rhythm to the day to keep things predictable. And that really sort of ease, you know, everybody into the day, into the, the kind of the week, you know, ahead. And I think that's really helpful. Um, and definitely for mums, uh, if we could really strive to have some time for ourselves, either carve out, you know, um, a, a 10 minutes, you know, in a day or um, parts of the week that you just have time for yourself, you know, um, you enjoy like reading a book before falling uh, asleep or it could be uh, like a short jog before work, you know, just to get ourselves a bit more centered, a bit more, um, you know, ready to face the world again. You know, I think that would be uh, something to consider, having a routine for ourselves as well. Mm, thank you, Dr. Adlin. I mean, right now, yeah, I mean, right now, with, uh, you know, in the current situation, I, I'm quite sure a lot of uh, mummies and daddies are actually working from home. So, uh, so really, tr I mean, I remember the, the circuit breaker period where everybody was at home uh, trying to manage everybody's learning and emotions with each other. Uh, that was a real struggle. Uh, so, yeah, I, I totally appreciate um, the fact that you know, actually for working parents, we, we have an outlet somewhat uh, just to kind of uh, regroup our thoughts. But yes, definitely. No, thank you, Dr. Adeline. Most certainly. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, also, Dr. Adeline, sorry, I've just got one more, one more question. Sure, Sereni, yep. Yeah, uh, you know how that, you know, the, the, the buzz of the word right now is uh, positive engagement and then uh, 
you know, I have I have friends, uh, you know, uh, who, who tells me, oh, you cannot say no to your child because uh, that will impede the child's learning and, and things, uh, uh, you know, it will, it will stop the child from wanting to explore. I mean, uh, personally for me also, I, I have a child, my daughter, specifically. She can't take no for an answer. I mean, would you have uh, perhaps advice on how to manage that? Oh, wow. I think that's a nice one. Because um, I grapple with that too. <laughs> I think we, we are in an era where um, taking no is uh, sometimes a skill, you know. Uh, I mean, of course, uh, we do need to help them differentiate uh, right and wrong, what is appropriate and what's not appropriate. I think that's still within the role that we uh, should definitely play. Um, but what I think what could be helpful here is um, maybe perhaps thinking about how we could explore that particular request or that particular need that they have, right? Mm. So perhaps an exploratory kind of way of uh, engagement might be something to consider. For example, Oh, um, I'm just curious why you uh, you mentioned that, or, or where where did you probably hear this? You know, or maybe can you share more? You know, so we allow the exploration to uh, to start off to hear a little bit more from them, and then before oh I see, um, do you think it's appropriate if you were to do it that way? So again, uh, it's a way we kind of phrase the question um, to guide them to think through. At the mm -hmm. same time, gently you know uh, guiding them to that is perhaps not a very wise thing to do but helping them to see along the lines with you the rationale as well as the reasons why it's a no so that's perhaps one way to consider mm -hmm. is, is there is there a, an appropriate age to to start i mean when it comes to rationalizing uh, uh you know would it be appropriate uh for me to uh, rationalize with perhaps a toddler <laughs> or, or yeah i mean is there is there an age where i can start uh Oh yeah, I mean, I, I yeah. don't think I can rationalize in my eight months. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> who's, who's into putting things in her mouth and, and when you say no, she just will, you know, she'll like growls at me. I see. I mean, yes, uh, I think the simple, the message is, the, is better for the younger ones. Um, I think it's also the tone in how we approach that situation. So um, it could be um, a situation whereby it could be a dangerous situation, for example, and you might come uh, forward to say, oh, that's really dangerous. You know, it's your tone to say that, oh, this is really uh, not a good thing to do. Um, and sometimes uh, if we, we want to consider saying no in a way that it is uh, a bit more acceptable, things like, no, 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 you know, this is not good. This is not appropriate. So it, it gives a bit of space for them to, oh, okay, this is really not suitable. Um, so it's again, tone is again about how we, we you know, uh, get, get them to see that this is not a good thing to do um, and simplify the message. Yeah. Mm, thank you. Yeah, I think, I think tone is something that I'm learning <laughs> to control. Because <laughs> sometimes I have to do a quick switch between my elders to my youngest. Uh, yeah, so, but really, that's, that's amazing. Thank you for the tips. Most welcome. Yes. Okay, let me just check in. Uh, is if Dr. N is in, has it? Would you be able to provide us any insight on that? Okay. Um, we're almost uh sort sorting it out already. So uh, please give us uh, a moment. Yeah. Right. Thank you. Yep. Apologies to all the attendees. Uh, you're the lucky ones. <laughs> this is actually our third session. Uh, for education symposium. Uh, so yeah, on behalf of uh, Mendaki, thank you again to all the attendees that, that's joining us today. I think we have a wonderful 216 participants already, so mm -hmm. so excited to have a, a bit of a discussion later in the yeah. Q&A. And I think there's also an opportunity for them to uh, pose some questions. Am I, am I right? Yes, in fact, mm -hmm. um, you know, if they, they already have any questions. In fact, I, I, I'm seeing a few questions already. That being posted, uh, yeah, I think uh, may I check with um the education symposium team? Is it okay if I perhaps uh post these questions to Dr. Adeline? Or okay, all right, Dr. Adeline, we have uh we have a few questions um on our Q and A. Uh, we have a question from uh, Miss Masrina. So uh, she is in a situation where I think uh, she has a toddler and also baby. So what are the what are some of the strategies, approaches to comfort 
a four-year-old. Oh, sorry, she doesn't have a baby. I'm sorry. It's, she wants to know how to comfort a four-year-old who cries to school every day for almost three months. Oh, dear. Oh, I feel you, Miss Masrina. <laughs> Dr. Adli, perhaps you can uh, share. Yeah, Miss Masrina, thank you so much for your question. And, uh, you know, and I'm really glad that you brought it up. And I think for our young ones who may have some challenge adapting to school, especially in a more formal setting like a, like a childcare setting or it's a school building that they say, oh, this is very different from home. Uh, I think it's quite natural for children to feel some anxiety and some, um, so we call it sometimes separation anxiety, but it does fulfill some criteria. Um, they persist a slightly longer uh, over a slightly longer time, and it is challenging also for um, parents to then see how you know they would then you know make the the, the experience pleasant in uh, sending their child to school. But it also requires um, the teachers to come on board with you to see how they could ease that transition at the start of the day when they when you know you send your child to school how they could they could team up with you to make the transition to make the receiving part of the day uh, more pleasant. So I've been working with uh, many parents and teachers, uh, especially in this area, and it, did, it, did, it does take some time. Um, often uh, what parents can do is to you know, read stories about um, school, um, to give the message that school is really a place where you could you know, uh, meet more friends, you know, uh, send a consistent message that school is a place that you could you know, have a, a time to learn and uh, play with friends, you know, and um, sometimes uh, also visit the school, you know, during your weekends to, to make it less of a, of a place that they might worry. So you kind of desensitize them to the place. Uh, for some parents, I you know, encourage them to bring their child to a new setting uh, earlier so that they are better prepared to, to, to know what this place is about. Um, and, and for teachers, what I try to, to uh, advise them or to, to work with them on is having a nice routine at the start of the day um, and uh, you know, let, letting them sit maybe at the front area of the school, you know, um, talking to them, um, reading along a book with them, uh, maybe a comfort toy to help them feel comfortable just being in the school premises. And then slowly and gently, you know, say, oh, we're going to be playing right now. Would you like to join us inside? Um, so I think it's about, you know, trying to match their emotions at that point in time when they're crying, you know, and, and being gentle and coming to, you know, to a place where they are with you together emotionally and then easing them into uh, the day. Um, but I would also like to encourage uh, educators and early childhood educators to be supportive and yet also firm at the same time. So there is a place where firmness would come in to say, oh, we are about to start now, let's go in. So there's also that part where uh, teachers and parents can work together to allow that um, transition to be something that uh, is expected. The child knows that this is a, a school day. Um, at the same time, when it's a handover or rather it's a receiving uh, time for the teachers to take over, then it's a quick goodbye. Say, I'll see you later, okay? Have fun. And then you make that um, transition quickly. And uh, for teachers to, to make the, the early part of the day pleasant and to ease uh, the child into class. So mm -hmm. those strategies have worked uh, quite well. Um, but certainly for some children, it persists longer than four months. Then uh, sometimes it's to seek uh, support. Maybe from the school principal, you can talk to them a bit more whether there is a school support team in your, uh, in your, in your child's setting to, to you know, come together as a team. Or uh, sometimes external help might also be uh, needed sometimes. Mm. Okay. Yeah, the question. Question. yeah, I mean, you you brought uh, uh you brought in the point of um educators also being part of that supporting environment because we have another question from an anon anonymous uh, attendee about creating an emotionally safe classroom for our students. Perhaps would you like to expand a little bit more, Dr. Adli? A safe environment. Uh, emotionally safe very... classroom. Emotionally so, safe classroom, yeah. am I right? Yeah, because just now you did mention, you know, uh, for educators to also play a role and take on, you know, for a child who's emotionally yeah. distressed going mm -hmm. to school. You, you did mm -hmm. uh, share a little bit. Would you like to expand mm -hmm. a little bit more uh, yeah. for our fellow uh, attendees? Yes, uh, I, I love this topic because, you know, um, in, in my area of work, we really work with emotions and we work with behaviours as well as uh, the thinking of uh, the children I work with as well as parents and, and teachers. Um, 
So emotionally safe environments would be, uh, there are a few features of that, if I, if I may share some uh, more of a personal and professional uh, experience point of view, uh, is where um, your views, your child, a child's views is heard and not dismissed. So for example, if a child were to come uh, forward to a teacher, say, teacher, I'm so scared, you know, teacher, I, I think I, I, I lost something, you know, that the teacher is emotionally ready to listen to the child. Um, and to be able to come to the level of the child and say, oh, what happened, you know, to explore again, uh, what could possibly be worrying the child or was there a problem that the teacher may not have uh, noticed and uh, where the child is able to express and the teacher is willing to listen to um, what was explained and being able to take uh, actions together with the child and again, not dismissing. And also, um, the second part to it would be a, a non-judgmental uh, Base in where when you listen, you are not uh, having a judgmental lens to what the child is um, sharing. So it's really coming from a space of uh, listening, being empathetic, um, being emotionally available uh, for the child to express whatever that is on the mind uh, of the child and to then say, oh, okay, that must be quite challenging. And also to acknowledge the feelings of the child, definitely for sure. For example, um, and maybe, maybe also labeling uh, the emotions with the child. For example, um, you must be feeling a bit tired, a bit um, scared, or you might be feeling a bit sad, or you might be feeling disappointed. So those uh, emotional vocabulary will come in very handy, handy, so that the child will know that oh, this is the emotions I'm feeling, and it is disappointment. And from then on, they're able to communicate that a bit better next time when you know this is the emotion and this is what the word is for the emotion. I think we've got some wonderful resources there under our social emotional development um, materials in, in early childhood. I think there's quite a, a, a few out there. So things like, um, you know, having a story time whereby, you know, allowing every child to share their feelings and, uh, you know, openly uh, giving opportunities for friends to share and contribute to discussions, um, teachers showing that they are empathetic uh, listeners. I think these are important ingredients uh, towards, uh, uh, you know, in terms of a positive experience, in terms of emotionally um, accepting kind of classrooms. Yeah. Okay. So going by that line of um, expressing emotions and, uh, you know, uh, connecting it with uh, certain uh, facial features. So is, is this something that um, one to two years old can relate? Because we have um, a question from the attendees. Uh, for one to two years old, how can you help them understand and express their emotions? Oh, one and two year olds are so cute. Um, and they're, and they're so curious, right? And uh, they are really watching, they're very observant. Um, and that they are looking at body language, they are looking at facial expressions, they are also listening to you, you know, even though we, we might think that they, they don't really know the concepts, but they are really learning. Uh, they're learning from all these different um, cues that you get, right? Um, and you can sense environment uh, pretty well too. Um, so I would say that uh, for young uh, toddlers and uh, for our one and two year olds, uh, showing them would be quite key. Uh, what we mean when, when we are ex explaining certain things, um, so sh teaching by, by showing is one way, um, showing them uh, different ways to solve a problem whereby, oh, let's say we are playing with, uh, with them using a toy and it doesn't work out, um, ask them, oh, what happened? So simple questions would, would really help in, in scaffolding their learning, um, building together and say, oh, do you think this works? Do you think this, this color works? So always inviting them to participate in the play will be really, really critical so that they learn the concepts as well. Um, so a lot of showing, a lot of simple language, uh, sim simplified language will really help. And also as you're scaffolding, uh, demonstrate and use the words so that they could learn the vocabulary. Mm, okay, thank you, Rota mm. I'm going to so try that out on my eight-month-old, you know. So we are at home, we are really trying to uh, show her all the positive emotions. But there has been times when mommy just, you know, things get a bit too much for mommy. <laughs> mm -hmm. So, uh, yes, definitely. I think I agree with Dr. Adeline. It's all about, uh, you know, learning and everything starts from the parent uh, at home, in fact. Uh, okay, we have um, an attendee by the name of Miss Sue. Uh, what are your thoughts on separation anxiety when sending a baby to infant care? And how can we overcome this? 
I think it, would it be similar, Dr. Adeline, to how you manage a toddler? Um, it would be quite similar, as in like make uh, the goodbye quick and sweet and, um, and pleasant. So in a way, uh, also honouring the time that you say, oh, I'm going to pick you up later. So the person who uh, you had said you know, will come to pick up, uh, will try your best to be the person who you have promised to pick up at the end of the day. So there's, there's the sense of trust and you, you know, uh, what you say is you know, what will happen at the end of the day that really be able to then help the child to know that, oh yeah, you know what mom said is true, that you know, mom's going to come and pick me up. So that's certainly important too. Um, but yeah, I mean, uh, when you're at home and spend as much time with your child and, you know, um, you know, the attachment is really, really important at home. And when you play with them, um, talk about stories about going to school, positive, uh, nice stories about school. Um, and, and, you know, for, for toddlers, it's really about a routine as well. So hopefully your routine, your night nighttime routine is pretty consistent. Your morning routines are also quite consistent so that they feel that, you know, it's a bit at ease mm. for them. Okay. Yeah. yeah, I noticed routine also seems to be uh, something that works very well with uh, younger children. But then again, to draw back to routines, I, I, my elders are not very good in managing routines. In fact, um, from young, but, it, but uh, with the twins, I actually noticed that they do better with routines. So does this also again boil down to each child's characteristics, doctor? Oh, yes. Um, you know, Every person, uh, every individual have their own set of um, gifts, you know, in a way, our own strengths, our own limitations, weaknesses, and things like that. So every, every, every one of us, we, have, we are just so unique beings, right? And we have personalities, uh, you know, from, from young, you can see that, you know, one child may have a different temperament from another child, and that's completely normal and natural. Um, and I think when we have routines, sometimes things work for, you know, some children, some you need to be more flexible for some children. Mm. So I think that where I think as parents, we are uh, we also need to be adaptable and nimble at times to see when can we, uh, where do we have to draw the line? Where can we be flexible? And it's really about observing quite carefully what mm. really helps for one child and we, it may not help the other child as well. And be able to then make some uh, provisions or accommodation when it warrants so. So I think uh, it really rests on what we can also see what works for each child may not necessarily work for another child and be prepared to make some adjustments. Yeah, it's been, mm. it's been a, a learning experience, I mean, for, for the past 14 years. Mm. Uh, thank you, Dr. Adlin. Uh, I think we'll go uh, to the Mentimeter just to take a look at what are some of the responses on the questions. We will we'll come back uh, to the question and answer that's been put out by the attendees. Thank you so much for all the questions. Oh, thank you. Okay. Now we can see the Mentimeter filling up. What about the other question? May I invite um, Hazik to perhaps share a little bit about the Mentimeter's response? We only have 82 responses for this question. May I encourage um, the other attendees uh, to also, you know, uh, make your vote. So for those who have not um, give, given your answers, I've, um, we're seeing some of you that have just joined us. So um, you can log into menti.com and use the code 116589 to answer, this, uh, this, answer these two questions. The uh, first question um, being, what makes your child or particular student special to you? And the other question, what is something you love doing with your child?
Okay, um, Dr. N has uh, finally um, gotten to join us. Uh, Dr. N? Dr. N, uh, I can't turn on your camera, but would you be able to hear us or uh, respond? Would you be able to um, share your screen, Dr. N? Technology has an amazing way of um, doing magic on us. <laughs> can't, can't live with them and can't live without them. <laughs> okay, let's just uh, give Dr. Anne a bit of time. For this mental data, I'm seeing, uh, you know, some of the sharing very, very interesting sharing like the tenacity to learn wow yes uh, definitely that makes a child really special some are active curious kindness yeah i thought uh you know at, the, at this platform i probably also want to uh, give a shout out to the twins uh, preschool teacher who, who actually made learning such a fantastic, um, amazing experience, um, you know, bringing up, uh, you know, bringing out the best in the twins. Because uh, Dr. Adeline, uh, you know, educators are so important because, um, you know, literally the, the children spend uh, more, you know, to a certain extent, spend more time with the educators uh, on, the, on the weekdays that, that the parents are working. Uh, I noticed personally, uh, and I appreciated the educator that, that was um, with the twins, that journey with the twins from nursery all the way until kindergarten. And they, they turned out to be such amazing, amazing uh, twins because um, they become so lovable, you know, and, and, I, and I'm just amazed. Yeah. So to the educators out there, uh, you know, we, I just want to say thank you and, and you know, keep on doing, the, doing an amazing work. Yeah. Amazing early child educators we have. That's why. Right. Yeah. Because... You know, for parents who's working from home, we 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 really really bank on the fact that they they experience and they come across amazing people at school, and and there's nothing more a parent can ask um, except for a very loving teacher, and uh, who who takes on the children, you know, uh, and um, imparting amazing valuable experiences. Yeah. So. I'm so excited to actually get to share with you a little bit about how we can help children feel safe and ready to learn. And I imagine you've all been talking about that quite a bit. But the first thing, next slide. So unlike many other species, um, the human brain develops at least into their um, 20s. And actually, uh, and actually, the, we know from pictures of human brains versus chimpanzee brains that our brains are really built very immature at birth. And it's because we're expecting new knowledge to guide us through development. And our brains keep growing and changing into the tw our 20s. And that would not happen if we weren't expecting this new knowledge. So that's really exciting. Next slide. But different environmental input can lead to different types of learning. So 
although we're always ready to learn, and it's not like one environment is going to keep us from learning, what we learn, what we, um, how our brains develop may be shaped by our environmental stimulation. So if you think of that panel on the left where it says blue skies and it's sunny skies ahead, and you think if you're born into that and you're getting signals that look like everything is, you know, blue skies, what are you going to prioritize? Well, you might prioritize becoming very book smart and knowledge that helps you become book smart. You might also grow up pretty slowly because there's no rush. You don't have to worry about adult challenges. You can spend a lot more time just engaging with the world as a child. But if you're getting all kinds of signals that the world is actually a threatening or a scarce place where things are going to be very tough, then actually your brain's still learning, but it may be encouraging learning of street smart kinds of behavior or to grow up very quickly and to learn those kind of skills that help us understand what's going on at the edges of things and not necessarily focus, but think about what's going on outside of the main part of attention, outside of, of the classroom. How can we um, think about being reactive to threats and, and feelings of insecurity? Next slide. So a question for us as caregivers, right, as educators and, and parents, is how can we encourage sunny sky development? How can we make children think that the environment that they're going to get, that the brains that they need are for these sunny skies? Well, next slide. There are a lot of things that we can do. So one of the things that we can do is really notice our children's signals. So for example, these can be big signals or small signals. Sometimes if a child comes up to us crying or showing us a new toy or jumping up and down, those are things that are somewhat easy to read in terms of what they might want or need. But there are other things that can be more subtle. So um, I'm thinking right now of a video that I, I've seen from a mother and her six month old baby where she was just sitting behind the baby and they were trying to read one of those, you know, those books that you can crinkle with your hands. And the six-month-old was interested in it for a little while, but then her gaze just started looking elsewhere. Well, that in itself is a signal, but this mother was beautifully positioned behind her baby and actually was craning her neck down to see where is this baby looking? What else might she be interested in? And the mother saw that the baby was interested in a toy. She wasn't old enough to get it yet, but that's where her interest was focused. And so the mother helped her for that. That was a very subtle signal and really required the mom's full presence to notice. Other times, um, the signals, you know, whether they're big or small, they might need to be interpreted. So is a child giving a signal for play? Are they giving a signal for support? Are they giving a signal for autonomy? All of these things are really important. When they give a signal for play, it may mean that they want some help. They want to enjoy that interaction with you. When it's a signal for support, um, they, may, they may need a little bit of help, but again, this depends on what else is going on and what their developmental stage is. So sometimes they'll let you know, but sometimes it just might be that, that you know as a caregiver, hmm, a young child isn't going to be so great at following directions, or they might be great for a young child, but not compared to an adult because their brains are still learning how. They don't necessarily remember that something that you told them yesterday, they might not remember that today, or they may not be able to, to understand that a rule about um, <clears throat> washing your hands before lunch is the same rule as that you need to clean up before before dinner as well because these are slightly different um, things and so ah uh, yes these are the slides uh, so I'm not sure which slide deck we're on 
right now. Um, we could try going to the next slide and, and see which one it is. Um, but what I was saying is that, that we need to take into account the um, so the development need and I again I, I apologize for this but why don't we go down um, scoot down a little bit uh, let's let's skip that one because we've kind of covered it skip this one skip yeah skip down a few more slides if we can a little bit farther down farther down farther down. That one, that's great. And we can show that video of a wonderful mommy and child. Um, if we go to slideshow view, we can click on the video and we can see the way that this mother is recognizing her child's needs for support because he's young. So, and we, if you don't mind just clicking through, we'll see some bullet points come up next to the video. Yeah. So, what we saw this mommy do a really amazing job is recognize that he was giving some signals that he needed support, right? So the job, the instruction was don't let him touch anything. And the mother recognized he's young. He may not be able to remember these simple rules across new activities. She gave him lots of examples of other things that he could do with his time. You can look but you can't touch. She reminded him of the rule. She gave him an alternative. We can say hello to each one of those toys. We can name the toys. She was right there with him. They were in it together. She acknowledged how hard this was for him, right? So he's, he's young. This was a really difficult thing to be able to do. And she said, oh, that's one of your favorites. All of those things recognize that this is difficult. They recognize these subtle si skill, um, signals that he's giving for support. And so that is a way that we can encourage this kind of sunny sky development to say, hey, I'm here for you. I can help you out with these things that you're a little bit too young or, or maybe have difficulties doing. I think we can move to the next slide then. So, so the next thing then is that we also need to remember that sometimes we can, next slide please, sometimes children are also signaling for autonomy. So they need our help for lots of things. And one of the things that they need to do is to develop and their job is to become independent. So if we click on this video here, we'll be able to see, and maybe we wanna click right where that circle is, um, we'll be able to see that Scott is very excited to be playing with his mother. But yeah, just there. But he wants a chance to do it on his own. And he shows her that with his behavior. He doesn't say it, but he shows her and she notices it and lets him have a turn. So let's look at that. Okay, so that was just something very small, but it's an important thing. And if we can run through some of these bullet points, we can expand on that. Um, a little bit. So it's important to remember that it's not naughty to want to for kids to want to do things on their own. Um, but you know, with parents and with caregivers and with teachers, we have to think about a lot of things for our children. There are lots of times where we are going to have to step in. And so when there are opportunities to let them do things on their own, we don't need to sweat the small stuff. We can wait and pick our battles. And it's really important to recognize their accomplishments because we are so important to them. It means so much to them to hear that we've noticed when they've been able to do something, whether it's something emotional or something with play or exploration. And that gives them the confidence to keep trying and to keep going. Next slide. So all of this then, next slide, needs to be done in a timely and responsive way. And I think everyone in this audience has gotten some good examples today of how that timely and responsive nature may be important, right? We can notice things, we can interpret them, but if we don't act immediately, it can, it can cause some distress. And that's especially true for young children because they don't perceive time the same way that we do. Things can seem like an eternity for them. What you see here in front of you is from a system that's used to kind of look at parents and children 
um, or caregivers and children in infancy. And um, we can see, you know, maybe you want to take a look at some of these sentences and see which ones of them are things that you feel like you do or um, your colleagues or co-parents do and which ones you might expect would be really um, useful for this kind of sunny sky development. Next slide. And, and so if you see one, you have this blue bar, you see numbers behind them, right? So the ones with the higher numbers are things like building on the focus or responding to the baby's signals, responding to their emotional state, even praising the baby. Those are things that are associated with this kind of responsive and sensitive care. Whereas tuning out or actively opposing the, the child um, or setting all of the interactions without, without thinking about the child's needs, those really are in contrast. And these are the kind of things we see with babies, but if we move to the next slide, we can see a very similar set of behaviors when we're looking at preschoolers. So as we all know, right, you don't just care give one-on-one. Um, -on -one. Lots of times there's many, many other things going on. One of the things, next slide, that really helps with building up this responsive and caregiving, the sunny sky kind of um, caregiving is to be able to respond appropriately, even when there's lots of things going on, to recognize that even our preschoolers still need help controlling um, affect and to be flexible when interacting with children. Next slide, please. So why does this kind of caregiving signal sunny skies? Well, next slide. Uh, ne if we think about the world, Every, every new experience is a little bit of a challenge. And we can use our behavior to engage with that experience. And then that can lead to brain growth in areas related to learning and memory. But if we, we sometimes though need to be able, sometimes these new experiences can be a little challenging or difficult or even scary. And sometimes then we need to be able to concentrate or regulate our moods in order to engage with them. And that kind of thing can be really hard for young children. Uh, next. So young children will give these signals, say things like crying, talking, laughing, asking us for our support. And next. And if we scaffold and comfort, it helps them achieve this goal and their brains get the benefit of that. However, next, if we, um, next, if we aren't so responsive to that kind of signal, it can lead to some physiological changes. Our whole bodies will gear up being ready for stress. And then that in turn, next, impacts the brain in a different way. So the brain still changes, but not in the way that's um, more associated with that kind of sunny sky change that I think many of us want to see. Next. So this is especially important when something is really scary or really new. Next. And next. And that's because children, you know, there's always balancing and probably adults too our needs to go out and learn and explore new things and to feel comforted and safe. And next, when we have a threat, we're going to change that balance next from exploration to comfort. And our brains then aren't going to be looking for new opportunities to learn and play. They're going to be looking for ways to feel safe. And if as parents and teachers, we can help to and aunties and grandparents, we can help to reduce that threat. Next. Next. Then we're really giving our children a chance to go back and explore the world because they don't have to worry so much about the comfort and safety because we're here for them and, and we're helping them with that part and they get to do their job of learning. Next. 
So there are lots of experiments that actually take a caregiver. In this instance, I have um, a picture with a mother, but we can look at these relationships with other people as well. Uh, and they take the, the mother and the infant and they put them into a new room that's filled with toys. And they look to see next, whether this history of how much sensitive and responsive sunny sky caregiving the child has received, what that leads to in the room. And what they find is next, that when children have had that kind of caregiving, they go, they explore the toys, next. If a threat occurs, they look for their parent, next. Then they go and next search the, for the parent, and they receive comfort. And once they receive that comfort, next, next, they can go back out and start exploring all over again. But when a child has experienced a different kind of care, next, so when the parent is inconsistent in terms of doing that kind of sensitive and responsive caregiving, instead of going out and exploring, they're more focused on the parent themselves. Next. They don't really take advantage of the new situation. Next. And if a threat occurs, next. They may try to look for the caregiver. Next. Next but they're still not very comforted. Next. And what that means is that they can't really return or even begin exploration. Now, next. If we see children who have had more rejecting experiences with their caregiver, next. They may go out and check out the new situation, but it won't be as um, complete. This is the kind of thing where you see children just kind of banging on toys rather than really turning them around and playing with them in complicated ways. And when there's a threat, next, they've learned that it's not really helpful to look for the caregiver for support, next. And so when the caregiver returns, they, they don't go seek that comfort, but then that also means that they can't fully engage with their environment. They're still stuck in this kind of low quality exploration. Next. And finally, we may have some children next who have really experienced more hardship. There might be some fear, not really abuse, but some fear in their relationships um, with, their, with their caregivers. And when they're in the same kind of situation, they may do okay, except next, next. When the threat gets too high, next, next, next. They may just not be able to regulate at all. And it really may lead to some problems um, in their exploration and also in how they um, are resilient in the face of adversity. Next. So what is the evidence then that these small ways that children manage this balance between between exploration and feelings of safety. What does it really matter out in the real world? Well, there's actually tons to suggest that it does, but I'm just gonna share a couple with you. So the first one, next, has to do with some comments from a longitudinal study of preschoolers, next, that um, teachers gave descriptors of some of their students. And you can, I'll, I'll pause for a second, but you can see that like item one doesn't sound so great, right? Mean to other children. Whereas item two does sound great. Okay, well-coordinated, agile, competent, vulnerable to life changes, both positive and negative. Number six sounds pretty good too, you know, um, shy but gutsy with the care group. <clears throat> Same thing as number seven, more powerful than meets the eye. So uh, competent and quiet. So these are, it's not that it, all these children are the same, but there's some positive things here. And next, in this same study, the teachers didn't know it, but the 
children, the preschoolers, had been observed in infancy in that same kind of toy-filled room that I told you about. And the ones here depicted in green, so number two, six, and seven, those were those kids that could balance it, that they could go out and explore, and they could get the comfort that they needed to return back to exploration. They didn't have to think about anything else. And the other kids, when they're in a challenging situation, if they didn't get that comfort, right, that might lead to these other more negative um, outcomes. Next. And there have, next, next, indeed been a lot of studies. This, these are results from studies looking at thousands and thousands of kids, um, mostly in the West, but not entirely, showing that this kind of secure balance when you get your needs met and you can go out and explore the world that it leads to higher levels of friendships less problems with attention or um, anxiety or aggression and so i think that that's really important to keep in mind next but it certainly doesn't mean that it's everything right so there are things that there are exceptions and there are things that we need to consider next so first of all, and this is really important, development is like train tracks or tree branches. Let's say you're climbing a tree and you wanna get all the way to the top left of the tree, right? Well, if you start and you climb a little bit to the left and then it branches and you climb a little bit more to the left and you keep going up that way, first of all, you're gonna get where you wanna go quick, more quickly and it's gonna be a little bit easier. Now. If you climb to the right first, can you eventually get to the left? Of course you can, but it's going to be harder and more difficult to navigate that journey. So you can always switch tracks, but it's harder to do so the farther you go in any direction. And related to that, it's not just one um, relationship that may play a role in our lives, but the more um, positive relationships we have starting from a very early age, the better. It doesn't mean that those relationships are going to protect us from everything. And it certainly doesn't mean that all of our children's problems are due to, you know, due to parents or, or vice versa, that all of their successes are due to parents. But it means that these kind of things, these important relationships with parents, the important relationships with childcare providers, with, with teachers, with extended family, that these are all helpful and important in putting them in the direction that we want to see. Next slide. Now, the other thing, though, is that an any of you with more than one child or any teacher who's taught more than one child will know that not all children are equally sensitive to the environment. Next. So in child development, we, we often talk about um, orchids and dandelions. Next. So we have some kids who are very sensitive to their environment. They, they pick up new things and those things are good or can be good or bad. So just like an orchid, if the environment, if the soil is really rich, if they're living in Singapore rather than um, some of the places I've, I've lived, for example, then the orchid will bloom beautifully. But if it doesn't have just the right thing, it may not bloom at all. Whereas next, Next, whereas there are other children who may be a little bit less sensitive to their environments, and it doesn't really matter if they have the exact right perfect um, caregiving or not, because they're going to be a dandelion, um, at least in certain areas, more no matter what. And so if they're getting um, a more negative environment, it doesn't really matter as much. And if they're getting a po more positive environment, it doesn't really matter as much for certain things. Although, of course, overall, we always want to give our children as uh, much of a positive environment as possible. Next. So the last, um, one of the last things I'd like to say is that the overall experience is what really matters. Next. So I've talked a lot about caregiving but of course, all kinds of other things are important. Stress, social support, nutrition, sleep, exercise, how old the child is, hormones, life changes, 
all of these things matter for kids and they matter for caregivers, right? We can't be sensitive and responsive if we can't sleep. Um, our children don't learn well if they don't have proper nutrition or sleep. These, the, the, whole, the whole child and the whole caregiver are important. And we need to take care of our children and we also need to take care of ourselves. And remember that no caregiving is perfect. Next. And so to end then, I really want to drive home this point that any child who is lucky enough to have some type of individual one-on-one -on -one care has a huge advantage. One of the things that I sometimes hear and as a parent think myself is, oh gosh, you know, my children could be perfect if only I just hadn't done X, Y, or Z. But if we think about this more like a tree, right? Or a seed, that would be like saying, next, that any seed we have was going to be this amazing tree if only we hadn't, next, done something wrong. And so any fault is, is, is ours, but none of the credit of growing the plant. Whereas next, what I would really say is the way we should think about this is much more like, and the science supports this, is that our children are like seeds. We can plant them, but without us, without any help from us at all, they're not going to grow. Full stop, they are not going to grow. Think about a baby, it cannot grow on its own. But if we give it some nurture, next, it will grow a little bit. And if we give it some more nurture, next, it'll grow more. And each positive thing we do, next, can help it to develop. And that in itself is a huge accomplishment because look at how different that is than if we had done nothing at all. It's, it's, so we really need to think about how this individualized care and concern is a huge advantage. And with that, I would like to say thank you. Next. And if I... Tarima Kasi.